Oh, Father, thank you so, so much for your word, your presence, your life, the gifts that we've been given from you, Lord. Uh, all of this, Father, thank you for a beautiful day. And, and most of all, Father, thank you for, for you and that you are in this place and that, Lord Jesus, we get the privilege of being with you. I ask, Father, that you would open our minds to your word, help us to, to see it clearly, keep us from going astray, and, and Lord, I pray that your word would come alive to us to strengthen us, help us, Father, through it to become more like you. And Father, I ask for your anointing on each one of us as we dig into your word once again this morning. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, here we go. I am excited. Um, this morning. Good morning, guys. Welcome. I can. Uh, so I'm going to... Um, oh, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, come on in, come on in. It's okay. I am going to, um, it's been a couple of weeks since we've met. So we have to do a little bit of a review to kind of see where we were and where we are. Uh, and, and, and we've been on this amazing journey. If, you, if, if you've seen this slide and, and probably are tired of it <laughs> by now, I'm, I'm pretty tired of it, but we've, we've taken this journey from faith and now we're in the middle of life. As you see, our little, our little picture here. And, and we're in chapter six. We've, we've begun right in the middle of his, our freedom. And this is what I've talked about is our faith, right? And, and, and what, what Paul is doing in six, seven, and eight is he's, he's taking some pictures from ordinary life in ancient Rome, pictures like um, baptism for, for the Christian, and today we'll talk about slavery, and next week we'll talk about marriage. Okay, these, these just examples from ordinary life, and point them and use them to help us understand what we now have as Christians. I'll just pull that close. Thanks, Dexter. What we now have as, as, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, this incredible privilege of a new life that we've been promised, right? For sure. So, so from, from the perspective of where we are, we've been, we are right smack in the middle of Romans. We are, by the end of December, or December 17th, I think it's the last Sunday, we will have reached chapter eight, right in the middle of, we'll be right at the end of chapter eight. In January, we'll start nine through 11, and then we'll, we'll finish up in 16, hopefully by the end of February, maybe March, if something goes haywire. Well, that's the plan. That's kind of where we are. All right, so what I wanted to do is just spend a little bit of time reviewing what we talked about two weeks ago, okay? And, and, and give you a little bit of an excursus of, of this idea of baptism. I, again, guys, I, I really want you to tell me, David, that didn't make sense. Explain it to me, right? Or, or oh, I had a question. And, and again, silly questions are out the window. There are none, right? If, the, if you really didn't understand a particular point or you thought, whoa, that's weird, ask me, <laughs> right? And let's talk about it. So I had a question last week about baptism. What did I really mean by this word baptism? And, and, and the reason the question came up was because it seemed to be so identified with believing that it, it gave a perspective or a per, perhaps a danger of thinking that this act actually brought us salvation, okay? So I want to address that issue. I want to address that issue. Some, you know, somebody asked me the question, and I really want to address the issue. So the way that I'm going to do it is, I, and, and this is how I recommend as well, the, 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 just the way that I did it, I'd recommend you doing it as well. If you have a specific question about a, a specific theme, this is what I did. I'll, I'll describe what I did. I have an app, and in my app, I Google. I, I, I looked up. It's the app looks at. Hey, Pani. <laughs> it, the, the app is. It's got a concordance. It, you know, it searches whatever multiple translations it is. I'm sure, you guys could find something on, on whatever Play Store or Apple or whatever. 
and Google or, or, and, and search it. So what I did was I searched Bapti, B-A-P-T-I, which would give me baptism, Baptist, baptizing, right? It would give me all these different words. And so I got all of these different words and, and the verses that represent these words, right? And what I did was I started writing them down. And for each one of those verses, I summarized the verse in my own language, in my own words. Okay, this is what I'd recommend you doing. I'd look at the verse and try to put those, the words in your, hi, hi how are you, Marion? Hey, guys. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's to try to get those words to, 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 sorry, to try to get those verses into your own words to understand what it's really saying. And then what I did was I broke it up and said, this is really what the New Testament is saying about baptism. Now, this is super high level and it's very short, and I'm certainly missing a great portion of what it is. But what I did was I, I built it into five different points. Wow. Okay, five different points of what baptism is. And the, the way that I'm going to do it is a little bit weird because I had to make a last minute change. I thought I'd wanted to do it a certain way. I'm going to put everything up and then I'll talk about it. Okay, so I've got symbol, I've got command, I've got connected, united, and then not the point. Okay, <laughs> right? So all of it at once, I've just, I've just showered it onto you, right? And this is basically the result of my study. And what I did was I took my, you know, my waste paper. I always have waste paper from lots of bad prints. And then on the other side, I reuse, being good for the environment, <laughs> you know, all my papers I've taken. These are my notes, right, from my brief study on baptism. And what I've done is I've broken it up and said, these are, the, these are really the points of what the New Testament talks about when it talks about this word baptism, right? One, it's connected. And when, when I say connected, what, what I mean is 3,000 people hear the gospel in Acts chapter 2. A lot of people, they're, they're, they're listening and they believe, they're cut to the heart when Peter preaches to them, and immediately all 3,000 of them are baptized, okay? So they believed, they were baptized, okay? Same thing happens with Saul. He's in Damascus, Ananias tells him about what God wants him to do. He believes, scales come out, he's immediately baptized. Same thing happens with Lydia and company in Philippi. They, it doesn't say they actually believed. They listened to Paul and they were baptized, assuming that they had, a, they had believed what Paul said. It was as if believing and baptism were almost identical. It followed through with what, what they believed. Same thing goes for the jailer in Philippi, Crispus and company in, Corinthi in the Corinthians. And I've skipped several. Right? I've skipped a couple of, of, of ones that, you know, up here, but all of them have this pattern. As soon as they believed, they were baptized. Okay? So baptism, at least in the New Testament, it was connected with belief immediately. Okay, we, we still need to find the whole picture. Command. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19. What is the Great Commission? Can someone recite it? Anyone? Yes. Everything I've commanded you. Fantastic, Don. Exactly. Right. I mean, that's the Great Commission. It is to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. It's part of this core command that Jesus gives us. And you would assume if, if he's asking his disciples to baptize, they themselves were probably baptized too. <laughs> right. It was something commanded of, of them. I also put there in, 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 in Joppa, when, when Peter preaches to Cornelius and company, he starts to talk to them, won't go into the story, he's starting to tell them the gospel. They suddenly are filled with the Holy Spirit. These, these are Gentiles who are filled. And Peter immediately says, he orders, it says it in, in Acts, he orders them to, the, you know, they, that they be baptized <laughs> immediately, <laughs> right? Again, belief baptism. Okay, command. Symbol, right? Now, now here I'm going to wade into completely controversial topics, but I'm doing so because you see this idea. 
It's a baptism of repentance from, from John the Baptist. When he baptized, he baptized people as an act right after. You kind of see this as a pattern again and again. As soon as they repented of their sins, they, they took this symbol of, of baptism, kind of like my little wedding ring example, right? I'll come back to that. When they, when they repented, they were baptized as a result, okay? The same thing in 1 Peter 3, 21. He says there is a, you know, he talks about Noah and the ark, which symbolizes baptism. And Peter uses these words, which now saves you as a pledge of a, of a, of a good conscience before God. Well, Peter doesn't really mean that baptism saves you in and of itself, but he's saying this is what it really means. It's, it's a promise of a brand new life. He's following on to what John did. He's saying, just as these people who met John, listened to his message and repented, they stopped sinning and they made a promise somehow to God that they would start life over again. That's what repentance meant, right? A U-turn from their lives. That's what Peter meant. It's, it's a pledge of a good conscience and the baptism itself as a pledge, was a symbol of my decision to make a new life, right? Okay, and then we have the most controversial passage right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul, incidentally, he's talking about the resurrection from the dead and, 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 and saying if there's no resurrection, boy, our faith is useless, right? And then right at the end of that passage, he says, and by the way, if there's no resurrection, what do people do who are baptized for the dead? Do you know that passage? That, that little weird passage, <laughs> right? Well, it's, it's interesting that what, you know, what, what Paul is saying. He's, he's, he says this and he never actually explains what he means or what this practice was. Yeah, the Mormons do that. Yes, the Mormons do, right? <laughs> right? But, he, but he never explains it, but, but, he, but, he, but he mentions it in passing. And what's interesting about that is that he's not offended at the practice. Do you notice that? He's not, he doesn't give a whole chapter on why this is weird, right? He just assumes this is just what Christians do. And, 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 and it's interesting to me because as a practice, because it wasn't central to the faith, it was, it was almost a symbol. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of why. You, 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 you had the idea of, bapti of belief and baptism so connected in the early church, literally 100% of people who believed were baptized. It wasn't, there wasn't a choice that people made. They just did that as an act of obedience. We know these words, the outward expression of an inward faith. That's a, that's a part of how we think of it. But for them, the idea of believing and not being baptized was just weird. <laughs> Right? Because it was a step to say, yes, I believe. Now, what happens when somebody believed and died before they were baptized? What if they believed on their deathbed and they died? <laughs> right? They weren't baptized. What do you do? Well, believers felt like, you know, you, you, you felt like, you know what? I, I know that this is important. It doesn't save you, but I want them to have this seal this relative or this friend of mine who had died, I want them to experience this seal in their death somehow, right? It's weird. I have to say it's weird, but it's not offensive to the gospel, right? Paul doesn't, Paul does not, Paul isn't offended by it. He doesn't argue against it. He accepts it as practice and he uses it as an argument to say, if there's no resurrection, what these people are doing is completely useless, right? But it's almost as if this, let's, let's say I was, a, you know, I, I was married, we were a poor family, and I never had enough money to buy a wedding ring, right? So, so we got married, we were in love with each other, no wedding ring, we, you know, we, we went in front of the, 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 the court, we got, our, we got married, we, you know, but we were a poor family. Well, my husband dies, you know, and now I'm a, you know, I'm a widow and I, and I have enough money to buy a wedding ring. Is it so bad for me to go to the store and buy a band, and maybe two, and put it on my finger to say, yes, I was married, even though I never had it before I was married. I couldn't afford it. Is it so bad, right? No, it's just a symbol, and all I'm saying is, right? 
I was married. And I think to be to 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 not put or look down on a believer who did it, but to say, look, they they probably did it with a good conscience. That's probably what they meant, right? But understand, they looked at it as a symbol, right? They looked at it as a symbol. And finally, we, we've got united pain in Mark, in Mark 10, 28, John and James, the sons of thunder, come to Jesus and they say, can we kind of have the seats on your right and left? And they say, and Jesus says, hmm, <laughs> Yes, are you, are, are, you, are you ready to drink the cup that I'm, that I'm about to drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with, right? He says those words as if to say, are you ready to jump into the pool of pain that I'm a part of, I'm going to have? And they said, yes, we are. And then Jesus says, you will indeed. But as for the seats, that's up to my father, <laughs> right? But he says that he, he associates this idea of baptism with pain. The same thing is said about Moses. He, in, 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 in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, when the Israelites went through the water and the pillar of fire, they were baptized into Moses. They were united with Moses and the law. That's how baptism was looked at, right, from his perspective. And that brings us to Romans 6, what we talked about two weeks ago, Galatians 3.27 and Colossians 2. I, I forgot to put that on there. Bo all three talk about this idea of being one with Jesus in his death and in his resurrection. And that's how, how baptism looked like. It wasn't, Paul is almost saying, yes, you got baptized. You didn't fully understand why you, you did it. Let me explain the power of this symbol. Right? And that's what he was trying to do in chapter 6. And finally, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, this is, this is unique. He says, yes, I baptized Crispus and Gaius, maybe somebody else. But that wasn't the point. Do you know? He's saying, for God, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. As if to say, stop thinking about this symbol. It's just a wedding ring. Think about your marriage. That's the point, <laughs> right? So again, that's, that's, that's a broad perspective of baptism. And, and I want to ask you, so if, if, you, if you look at it and, and, and if you've never been baptized, right? Let me challenge you. Again, there's nothing wrong inherently with not being baptized. Inherently, there's nothing wrong. It's, it's, it, it's as if I, I go to, you know, to get married. We were at this wedding and they exchanged the rings. I was, I was looking at that. And, 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 and they say, well, no, forget this ring stuff. You know, I don't, you know, we're married. But let me ask you, but let me ask you. If you say to yourself, I don't want to wear this wedding ring. Ask yourself why. If you tell your partner, why don't you want to wear this wedding ring? Right? What is that person going to say? What is your spouse going to say? Well, you know what? I, 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 we're married, but you know, when I'm with my friends, I kind of don't want them to know that I'm married. I don't think that'll fly very well, <laughs> right? So you, you, you know, having this ring, this, this whole, the whole idea of the ring is to kind of almost brag to say, look, I'm married and I'm married to this wonderful woman and I love her to death. And this is, this, is, this is a symbol of that love that I have for her, isn't it? Right? Again, in and of itself, yeah, in and of itself, they're just pieces of metal, but they are a symbol of something very powerful. And I ask you, so if, if you've never been baptized, I want to challenge you to consider making that step in baptism, not because you have to, but because you want to. You want to wear a wedding ring. <laughs> Right? In, 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 in terms of the seal, this relationship that you have with God. Okay, that was my super fast, you know, the, go ahead, go ahead, Ken. The, the Cornerstone Chapel, mm -hmm. we were baptized a thousand people one after one evening. Oh, a thousand, a thousand people. people, insane. And this is 3,000. <laughs> this is insane. wow, crazy, right? Uh, yeah. I know. I mean, but, but what's interesting is that they never had classes on baptism for these 3,000 people. It was just, you put your faith in Jesus, and then you walked into this, this ritual because you believed, right? It was almost the first step saying to everybody, I believe, right? Anyway.
The, the explanations come in later, but... So do I need to choose explanation unless you want to, uh -huh. which I welcome? I keep hearing that this is people not very close to me, but li would like to keep away anyway. Yeah. Um, basically, if you don't get baptized by immersion, then... It's not real baptism. It doesn't, doesn't count. count. Doesn't count. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. Count, yeah. actually, you are disobeying yeah. the command. Yeah. So, so again, here, here we are on these... Right, right, right. So here, here, here are these fine points of theology. And I think, I, think I, I, my personal approach to it, these, these fine points, because Christians disagree. Christians who, who love Jesus disagree about the, the mode of baptism, right? And, 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 and I am of the, um, of the view to look at that as the, really the same way as, as Paul would have looked at those people who baptized for the dead. The point is the baptism. The point is the baptism, and even then, the point is not, it, the point is faith, right? That baptism was a symbol, and, and so brothers and sisters of mine who've, who've said, I believe baptism is not an immersion, but a sprinkling, it's okay. I'll call them brother, and I'll call them sister, right? I, I, I don't think that is uh, a theologically, or it should be a theologically divisive thing, right? I agree with you. So then how do you respond to a person who insists, no, you are not saved because you have... Right. So, 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 so again, back, back to the way that I, I put this together, the way that I would do it is I would challenge a person to say, let's, why don't you do that? Look at the New Testament and look up every single instance of what baptism was and then come to a conclusion. And I, and I would let the Holy Spirit speak to that person, <laughs> right? You did? David, I think you can also uh, look at the Old Testament because there was a requirement for uh, people who were outside for either illness or other issues to go and visit a baptismal <clears throat> pool called a mikvah. A mikvah, yeah. And men and women both used them. The high priest used the mikvah to, it was a pure kit, pit, purification ritual. He did it before the um, high holy days where he appeared right. to be an intermediary before the people. So the, the Jews definitely understood that this was a symbol of uh, being a part of something bigger than just themselves. Yes. It was the symbol, yes. as you said, to where the fact that they would be able to say, yes, no, I, I observe this, and so therefore I'm committed to it. Yes. Exactly. And so the Old Testament also supports the concept of being baptized for your faith to recognize right. your walk in life. Right. That's that's beautiful. That's exactly right. And I think I think I didn't I didn't go into all of the Jesus himself was baptized by John. He he you know John's like, are you kidding me? You you know Jesus is like just do it to fulfill all righteousness. Right? And 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 and, and of all the reasons that for me that was that was such a powerful reason. If my Lord who I've given my everything to was baptized Ought not I to do so also? <laughs> do you know? But, but to, to go back to what you're saying, I, th I think throwing the baby out with the bat water is the real problem here. It's, it's to say, look, some people have so associated baptism with faith that they believe if you're not baptized, you're not saved, right? So I can understand why they would feel that way, right? I understand, I right? I, 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 the reason I say I understand it is because it is, it is so associated with each other, with faith followed by baptism, that, that you almost get the sense that it is one thing in the New Testament. You have to really look carefully at, at all of the instances and then see really what the point was to be able to differentiate it. I get it. But, but to, to then say to that person, no, you don't have to get baptized to be saved. In fact, I won't get baptized to show you that I'm saved without having to be baptized is throwing that baby out, right? In a, in a sense, to go to that person to say, look, study the Bible yourself. Really look at it. Look at every instance of where baptism and faith is specified. I mean, it's talk. I mean, we have the thief on the cross who wasn't baptized. Yes, we can talk about that, right? But, but there's, 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 there's a sense in which there's something beautiful about this ritual, 
we don't have to be a part of, but we want to because we're in love with Jesus, right? And, 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 and again, this, this is a secondary issue for us as Christians. It is not primary, right? And, and, and to allow for people to come to me. And, and, and again, some of the reformers, some of the early reformers looked at baptism the way your friends do, right? They looked at it as, as an inherently a part of faith. You have to get baptized, right? And many reformers didn't. Right, so there was disagreement even in, the, in, in, in you know, 500 years ago about what this was. But to actually say, okay, brother, sister, <laughs> right? Whatever your, whatever your belief about baptism, let's agree that faith is at the root, right? Believing in Jesus is at the root. And leave it at that, <laughs> you know? It's, it's, it's not something I want to spend time arguing, you know? That's how I would respond, <laughs> you know? Um, time's running out. Gosh, I didn't mean to do it this fast, <laughs> you know. But really, we've got, we've got a lot to cover. Last week, or two weeks ago, we summarized. Now, this is, this is how I've summarized the first part of the first 14 verses of chapter 6, okay? Because we are to live a brand new life, because we are no longer slaves to sin, because we died to sin, we're dead to sin and alive to God, Offer yourselves to God. That's kind of like my summary of what cha- the first part was. And, and, and really, you know, the first part of chapter 6 was. And really, everything pointed to this verse in the same way. Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus, in Christ Jesus. Paul uses baptism to point to this one point, this one subject that says, Consider yourselves, reckon yourselves, believe yourselves dead to sin. That sin no longer is a part of, that doesn't have a controlling interest in your life. It doesn't have the authority or the power to dictate how you should live the life, the Christian life, right? It's something very separate. It's a very powerful message, especially when we look at our experience, right? And, and, and it's a challenge to me because our experience tells us, no, we are still wearing those chains, doesn't it? Right? We still feel, oh man, I screwed up again. I sinned again. Well, the, the message that Paul is trying to communicate, and he's going to do this over the, next, over the next three chapters, is, wow, you have the obligation to live a brand new life. In fact, you have the privilege of living a completely different life than you had before. Okay. By the way, by the way, when, when we come to 15, Romans 15, Paul tells the, the Romans, the greatest joy that I have and my greatest wish is to present the church as blameless before God. That's, that's what my job is all about. And he says, he says, I want to see you perfect before God. Beautiful, a blameless bride. And everything that I'm doing is to present you before God as pure, holy, and blameless, right? That's really his motivation. And you'll see, and you see that in 6, 7, and 8, right? He's really trying to say, guys, we ought to be so fantastically different from the world that the world thinks, man, here's a taste of heaven. Look at these believers, right? Okay. And then the last verse we ended with was, for sin shall not be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. Okay? And by the way, he's not mentioned law at all in those previous 13 verses. Right? Suddenly he says, because you're not under law, but under grace, sin has no authority over you. And now, for the next nine verses, he's not going to talk about law <laughs> at all. He's going to wait till chapter 7 where he brings up the subject of marriage, but we'll get to that next week. But he's asked this question, because you're not under law, but under grace, sin shall not be your master. He's come full circle. Now he asks the question, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? Anyone know what his reply is going to be? No way. No way. Absolutely. No way. (laughs) Right. By no means. Are you insane? I didn't know. This is ridiculous. Don't be ridiculous, right? His, his, his me genoito in Greek. By no means. I, no, no way. Just because we no longer have the law above us, but we live under grace, this, this, this complete freedom in Christ, 
it doesn't mean that we can go back into sin. Okay? And now he's going to talk about that. And he says it again. He assumes they understand this. And, and I, I'm going to pause in the middle and do a little explanation of what this word means that we'll, we'll talk about. But he says, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to serve him as slaves, okay? The word is doulos. Doulos. In, 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 the, the Greek is doulos. A very famous word. In English, we've, many of us have even heard it, right? But we'll get to that. To obey him as slaves, you are slaves, actually slaves, you know, you are in reality slaves to the one whom you obey. It's a little hard to understand his, his point in this one sentence until you actually, uh, until I actually insert those words, right? He says, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are in reality slaves to the one whom you obey. Whether you're slaves to, the, to whom the one you actually obey, whether you're slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness, okay? What is Paul saying right here? He's saying, look, if you say, I am now a Christian, the way that Paul talks about being a Christian from chapter 1, verse 1 of Romans. Do you remember that? Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. He uses the same word, doulos, but it's translated in all translations that we have, either servant or bond servant. Why? We'll get to. B Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel, right? He says, that's not just me, that's all of us. We've now become doulon, slaves of God, in a sense, right? That sounds kind of offensive if you really think about it for our modern years. When we hear those words, we've become slaves of God. And it's because we have a modern understanding of slavery. We're gonna, I'll walk through that a little bit later. But understand, he's saying, if you say that you are a slave to God or a servant of God, and yet when sin asks you to do something, you follow and do what sin asks you, you really are not a slave of God, but a slave of sin, right? What you do actually reflects what you believe, not what you say, right? That's very important. Remember this parable. There's a parable that Jesus tells of two sons right? He tells this parable where he says to one son, son, I want you to go today and work in the vineyard. And the first son says, I will not. But later he does it, right? He starts out by saying, I will not. He's rebellious, but then he says, oh, okay, I'll just do it, right? And he goes and works in the vineyard. And the second son, he asks the same question, son, will you go and work in the, in the vineyard? And the son says, of course, Father, I'll go. But he does not. And then Jesus asks the Pharisees, which of the two actually did what his father wanted? And they say, the first. And then Jesus tells them, you are not the first. You're the second. <laughs> right? And he tells them that, that, that the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of heaven, but not you. They're actually doing what God wants them to do. But that's, that's Paul's point right here. You are a slave of the one whom you obey. You are actually a slave of the one whom you obey. All right. Doulos. That's the Greek. Here's the English transliteration. Doulos. D-O-U-L-O-S. Doulos, from our perspective, when we hear it, when we, we, we hear that word, we think of this, this idea of a slave from perhaps the mid-1800s, the 1700s, where we had vast, this, 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 this vast this trade that, that brought slaves over from different parts of Africa and, and, and used them in plantations, right? We have this idea of, of what we, you know, possibly was this, this cornerstone of why we had the Civil War, possibly, right? This is very controversial, I think, in some places to talk about this, but, 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 but this idea is, is that's what slavery is. Well, in some senses, in, ancient, in the ancient world, slavery was like that, but in the modern world, sorry, but in, in many ways, it's very different from what our understanding of slavery was. So here are the similarities. Ownership, 
100% you are the property of an owner as a slave, whether this was in Paul's time or whether this was in our last 100, 200 years, you were completely the property of the owner. You were a slave either through being captured, being traded, being, being bought, being kidnapped through piracy or through whatever. That's how you became a slave. You rarely in our time volunteered to become a slave, right? Very few people would say, oh yeah, I wanted to be a slave, so I sold myself, you know? You wouldn't do that in our understanding of it, right? It happened involuntarily. In terms of humanity, this was true of, of slavery back then and of slavery, sorry, slavery back then and slavery in our general time. You were completely belonging to somebody else. You were looked at like a robot. You had no ancestors, no name, no history, no property. You were a piece of somebody, somebody else's. You were a possession of somebody else's, right? The bond servant, yes, I'll get to that, I'll get to that, I'll get to that, I'll get to that. Well, this was, this was this idea of what was true from yesterday and today, okay? The ancient world and the modern world. Well, here are the differences. Now, this is very important for us to understand. And, and, and again, the question I, I'm trying to answer is, what does this word doulos really mean, right? Why do translations use the word servant bond servant and slave and in different ways. How are they trying to answer this question? In the ancient world, we had ethnicity, right? In the modern world, we think of, of, of basically people who are slaves are coming from uh, a certain ethnicity or a certain race, right? Slavery was, was generally speaking for, for, you know, for people from Africa, uh, perhaps there was slavery in, in, in China, in, in, in parts of the world, but, but for the most part, you see that slavery is, is race-related, right? In, in our time, generally speaking. It may not be 100% true, but in the ancient world, that was completely false. Anyone could be a slave. It didn't matter whether you were uh, from... Africa or whether you're from Spain or, 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 or any part of the Mediterranean, you could be a slave. In fact, if we were sit, you're, sta you're sitting in this room right now, you would not be able to tell the difference between a slave and a freed person if you were in the ancient world. Okay? And this is very important because in the modern world, slavery is a lifelong thing. You just are a slave for the rest of your life. Whereas in the ancient world, it was temporary. Usually from the ages of 30 to 35, you had the ability to be free, right? And many people chose to become slaves voluntarily in order to become a citizen of Rome. If you belonged to a citizen of Rome as a slave, there was a legitimate legal path for you to also become a citizen the moment you were free, which was very interesting. And so one third of Rome, one third of the entire city was, were slaves. The, another one third were former slaves becoming freed people. And then the other one third were freeborn people. And researchers think, right? But the idea was that it was something like you would voluntarily do, as Ken was saying, you know, you, you would choose to become a bond servant of someone. And usually in that, that scenario was you were a slave, but you loved your master. You would say, I want to stay with my master, even though today I'm free. I've come to the end of my slavery, my term, but I want to remain a slave. And so you'd go to the, the doorpost and put that all in your ear and you'd be a bond servant, right? A voluntary slave. Well, slavery from the perspective of, of the modern world is it's agricultural, cotton plantations, all kinds of plantations, right? In the ancient world, it wasn't true. You had doctors, chefs, accountants, <laughs> programmers, if they exist, right? People, anybody, anybody could be a slave. In fact, you were literally more valuable as a slave because you were skilled labor. Right? And many people became slaves because they wanted to grow in skilled labor. Right? And, and, and so the church, many of, most of which they think, most of whom were slaves, were coming from all levels of society. Which brings us to our last point. 
The social status for slaves in the modern world really is the lowest, whereas in the ancient world, it depended on who you were a slave to. If you were a slave of the emperor's household, you could literally order a senator to do something and then he would have to do it, right? You had that much authority as a slave, right? So you understand the problem translators are having when they use this word doulos. We think of it in a certain way in light of our experience in the last two, three hundred years. But for them, it was a very different understanding of what it was. Do you understand what I'm saying? So translators are trying to communicate this word without <laughs> the baggage that associates with that word, right? It's, it's, it's like the, the idea of going into, uh, 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 into New Guinea and trying to talk about the Lamb of God. They've never known what this animal was, <laughs> right? What is a lamb, <laughs> right? So you have to go into all this explanation. Do you then change the scriptures to make it fit do you say, look, we, instead of lambs, we have pigs. Do we use the pig of God? <laughs> Sounds so offensive, right? Do we do? And, and, and so you have, you have this problem the translators have. How do you communicate effectively? Well, doulos is one such word, right? Doulos, yes, it means slave. Unequivocally, it means the word slave. But the translators, when they're saying slave, they also mean this idea of a servant. Servant in the sense they are not employed, they're fully owned, but they have the rights of what we have today as people who are maybe servants. And then, of course, what Ken talked about, bond servant, this, this idea that we just, we just mentioned. So keep that in mind when we use these words, when we use the word slave. Don't be as offended at Paul using it as you might be, right? Because when he's using it, it is not meant to be ugly. Do you get that? You follow along, right? So he says, but thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly, ek kardia, out of the heart, wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. Listen to how he says that, to which you were entrusted. You, were, you obeyed this teaching, he doesn't say, that was entrusted to you. Interesting, right? Here was this teaching, this body of teaching, I've given it to you, you obeyed. He said, no, no, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching, the teaching itself, you were given to, right? And, and, it, and it's interesting he uses that. It's actually very powerful because of this word form. The word form there is this, this idea of a mold, right? Or a dye, this, this cast, right? So he says, to which you were handed over. I, I've, I've got a little mold here. The idea is this embodiment, this teaching was something that was given to you and your responsibility was to consume it to the point that you became the mold itself, right? That was what Paul has in mind when he uses the word form, <laughs> right? It's, it's type, typon, T-U-P-O-N, typon or type or pattern. In some translations, I think the ESV, I'm not sure what the ESV uses, but it's pattern, the pattern of teaching to which you were entrusted, this mold of a teaching, right? To which you were entrusted. You have been set free, you've been liberated from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. He uses this word again, and again, I'm, I, I've, I've, I've had to step back to say, that's what Paul is trying to communicate. You've now given yourself as a volunteer to become a slave, to be fully owned by this idea of righteousness, okay? Again, I'll put it in a picture. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness, right? You are actually obeying righteousness, right? Not sin. Very simple. And then he says this, I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves. Powerless is, the, is another way of translating that word weak. You're weak. I put this in human terms. And, and he's saying, okay, 
It sounds a little harsh when he says this, doesn't it? Right? You're weak. I'm making this, this, I'm putting this picture in here because you just don't understand. You won't understand any other way. Well, what he's actually saying is, I'm using this analogy of slavery because in our fallen human nature, it's really difficult to explain the concept which I'm talking about. Right? So I have to use analogies, and he uses these analogies quite a bit. He's going to use marriage in the next chapter. Right? But he says, I'm using this, don't be offended, I'm using it to describe our relationship with either sin or with God. Okay, and then he says, just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness. Literally, what he's, that, that's my translation. The literal, what he literally says is, as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to lawlessness, okay? He's saying, impurity and to lawlessness leading to lawlessness. So now, offer them in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. Okay? And the goal is this thing called holiness. And we'll get to that. Okay? We'll get, we'll get to what that real, that word is very unique. But we'll get to that. So what he's saying is, just as you used to offer, and by the way, I'm really nervous about doing this. I'm nervous about doing this because I don't want you to get the impression that we've abandoned an old law and are now under a new one, okay? So he says, just as you used to be a proud person or be filled with greed or full of lust or filled with anger, just as you used to be a divisive person filled with envy and jealousy, bitterness, just as you used to be a gossip and you couldn't help yourself, Right? You couldn't help yourself. You were just that person. So now you can. You have the power to be different. And what he says is, so now offer yourselves to God. Offer your bodies, offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness from the last, the last week or the last week that we did this. Be a humble person. Seek to be generous, to be pure, to be filled with grace. Work towards unity, be charitable, forgive, rejoice in others' success, be truthful, protect others' reputations. Again, not a law, but you get the idea, right? So in a sense, you used to be a prisoner of sin, but now you're not. You are a prisoner of righteousness. Okay, right? Not the whole picture, an analogy. Okay leading to this idea of holiness. Some translations use this word sanctification. I hate difficult words, right? But that word is a difficult word, right? Holiness, sanctification, it sounds very theological, right? Well, the idea behind the word sanctification or holiness is this, this, this idea of one, purification, okay? And Two, consecration. We'll get to consecration. But purification, when you think of purification, you think of making clean, removing contaminants, filtering out the dirt. When Edith was talking about the mikveh, right, the the idea of purification was you would be baptized or washed ceremonially in order to become pure, in order to be able to enter into the temple or into relationships. And baptism, by the way, for Gentiles who wanted to convert into Judaism was to go to the mikveh to come out, and they were now Jews. It 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 wasn't in the, the Old Testament. It was something added later on, right? But that was this idea of purification. Well, in Delhi, in in, in India, we had very dirty water, right? This is is kind of like the, the machine that we had. There was two other pumps that, not pumps, these two other filters that took away dirt. If I just opened my tap, it's hard to explain, but I opened my tap in Delhi without one of these. And if we took a shower, it was always a messy shower. It was a horrible shower, (laughs) you know. So because it was literally dirt, sediment coming out. It was was groundwater pumped, you know, into the the main system. And that's, that's where we had water whenever we got water, you know. For six months, we had to get a tanker because there was just no water, 
In fact, the tanker water was clean. It was cleaner <laughs> you know, than, the, than the water that came from the well. But in any case, it was this idea of sediment and filth that had to be filtered in order for it to be drinkable. That's the idea of holiness. In order for us to be drinkable or, or almost purified, to be, to be acceptable before God, we had to be filtered. Holiness was this, this, this that, that, that was the first idea. The second one was this idea of consecration or a separation from the secular, to be dedicated permanently, to be declared sacred. And the, 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 the closest thing I could come up with, because we're a little weird, you know, in our time, is our church. That's from our website. <laughs> There's our church, right? Now imagine this, this, this is Sunday morning. We're worshiping on a Sunday morning. On Monday morning, this, all the chairs are moved out and a fish market from Lotte comes in and says, we need to sell some fish, <laughs> you know? Can we use, use your sanctuary, <laughs> right? Well, I guess we could do that, <laughs> you know? It brings in a little extra cash. But it almost seems wrong to do something like that, right? Because this, this place, even though we know God really dwells everywhere, is somehow special, isn't it? Our sanctuary is a place where we come together to fellowship and we are with God. We invite the presence of God. It, it's in, in a sense consecrated, right? You couldn't imagine using it as a place of business. And so Jesus, with a whip, you know, gets so angry when they're using the temple as a place for commerce. Well, you, you, this is my personal way of handling something similar. We have two, at least two bank accounts. We have one that's our main practical cash flow bank account. And we have another one which is used for tithes, right? It's a one-way bank account, I, I like to call it, right? Some of you have the same thing, right? We, 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 every month, I, I put money into that tithe account and I use it for forgiving, right? We use it for giving, but we make a decision that nothing ever comes out of that bank account ever for us. It is completely dedicated, consecrated to God. It belongs to him. Whatever goes in there never comes back to us. It always goes to God, right? That's the idea of consecration, right? So when he talks about this, he says, so now offer the parts of your body in slavery to righteousness leading to purification and consecration. That's what the word sanctification really means. Make sense? Okay, so when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. <sighs> I'm gonna skip some parts because we're almost out of time. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit or the fruit that you reap, for, uh, that you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. And not just the fruit, the wages, what you receive. Sorry, I skipped that part. The gift you receive, but how do you been set free from sin? I've been slaves to God. The gift you receive leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what Paul has been saying and he's trying to communicate is, by the way, this is a verse we use when we talk about evangelism. We use it quite a bit, right? To talk about this is really the gospel. Paul's not using it that way. He's saying, look, for you Christians, the wages of sin, continually living in sin is really only death. But now, the free gift of God, the benefit, the fruit of living a godly life is this brand new life in Jesus that has been given to you as a gift. We'll come back to that. January 1st, 1863. What happened? Anybody know what happened on that date? Okay. That was, history guys, history people? <laughs> that was the day Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. <laughs> okay? Now, Whatever you think of Abraham Lincoln, whatever you think of, really, you history buffs who know this far better than I do, pretend <laughs> for me, okay? What actually happened? So on that particular date, he issued a, you know, a, a document that said a whole lot of other things, but one of the things he said was, the slaves were now free. 
Two years later, it, it, it formed the, it, it was a part of the 13th Amendment, I believe. It was like in, it, at the end of December in 1865. But for that moment, for, for this, on, on December 31st, 1862, a slave was completely a slave. The next day, he was totally free. Oh, it happened, right, on that particular day. Now, let's imagine that it was enforceable and that truly that person was genuinely free who lived in Virginia, right? Now, I want to ask you the question, right? So, so you, you know that slave owners were pretty cruel people in our history, very cruel people. Here's, here's an example. This man, is, his name was Peter Burnett. He was a, a man who lived in, in, in Oregon. He, he moved from Missouri to Oregon. Uh, to escape some debts. He went into politics, became, the, I think, one of the first governors of California, issued these edicts. He was a slave owner all his life, and, and he was extraordinarily racist, <laughs> extraordinarily so, to the point that you know, he, he, he made a rule that no black people would, could or, 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 or should ever live in California or Oregon. And if you were found, doesn't matter if you were slave or free or whatever, if you were found in either of these states, you would be lashed, right? Or, and, and, and kicked out of the state. In fact, he had these rules about um, people from, from Chinese origin. They were also excluded, right? And, and he made these laws, no Chinese people could enter California, right? And he almost wiped out the Native American population in California uh, through his policies and what he did. He was a really a wicked guy, you know, not, not, not a very nice guy. Well, imagine here's this master telling this slave from one day to the next, that on, on, on December 31st, 1862, he's telling him, do this or you'll, be, you, you, you'll receive a flogging. Now, the slave for his entire life has received a flogging for disobeying, entire life. The next day on January 1st, when the master tells him to do this, but he's free to disobey, how do you think he'll respond? Oh gosh, he'll obey, it's so hard, right? Because he feels pain follows those words, doesn't it, right? Pain follows those words all the time. My entire life I've known nothing but pain as a result of disobedience. So I will do what this master says, regardless of what the law says. We as Christians are really in that same position. When we come to know Jesus, we have an entire life of knowing nothing but obedience to this master called sin, don't we? Right? And so when we hear Paul saying we are dead to sin, we are free from sin, but alive to, to Jesus, it's a whole lot harder for us to believe it because we have known what disobedience to sin really leads to. It's so difficult. And, and, and for, for those of you who, who've come to, to Christ later in life, to actually come to, to confront sin in your life, it's so difficult to not sin. I, 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 I can remember, if you imagine a video playing of, of those times where you are ashamed, you actually look in shame at what you've done, how difficult it was to do what was right, right? It's, it's, it's as if, here's a picture. Here you are, in prison to sin. And from one day to the next, God tells you, by his death and resurrection, you are free. The, the door is open. And you are welcome to walk out of it and live a brand new life. Right? It's like Shawshank Redemption. Have you seen, anyone seen that movie, Shawshank? There's this one scene, it's a really sad scene, where a man who's been in prison all his life is free. He's one day free. He walks out. He goes to a hotel room. You remember, if you remember that? He goes to a hotel room. He does not know what to do with his life. He has known only slavery or, or prison all his life. I won't tell you what happens, but it's very sad if you haven't seen the movie. It's very sad, but, but it's, it's, it's horrible because he, 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 you come out. You're free to come out but you don't know how to live your life because all you've known your entire life was slavery. So you have an open door, but you still are a slave to sin, right? That's really the condition for many of us. Well, Paul is trying to say, guys, please understand that it is not into an empty life that you're being asked 
to come to. You're being asked to come into a garden. You're being asked to come to spend the rest of your life with a man who loves you more than anything else. In fact, he is the one who built you. And he wants to walk with you. These, 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 these 12 disciples and, and many others who were with him for three and a half or three years, what a privilege it was, right, to walk with Jesus. Well, Paul is saying, you and I have that same privilege because his Holy Spirit now dwells within us. It's as if here they were walking with Jesus, but we have that same privilege to walk with the same Jesus. That's what Jesus promised his disciples. I, I'm, you think I'm leaving you alone, but I'm not. In fact, you'll be so glad when I go because you will have someone who really is me, right? Who is going to be with you forever. It's like a dad with his son, right? And this is, the, this is the, the other part of the story. The other part of the story is it's not just slavery to God. That's Paul's illustration. But Paul says we are no longer slaves to fear. In chapter 8, we'll get to this. But you are now called a son, a son of the Most High God. And that's what, that's what our life really is. We are holding the hands of God. We are holding the hands of our Father and we're walking this entire life with Him. So that when the voice of sin and of our old master yells at us and our knees begin to buckle, we have a hand to hold on to and say, Father, and His eyes, He's saying, just look at me, just look at my eyes and I'll help you. I'll help you overcome because I want you to look like me. Right? All right. That was... <laughs> Super fast forward, and I had to, I'm sorry I had to do that with baptism. Um, I may do it a little bit differently the next time. Because I, I've skipped a whole bunch of stuff in order to get done. But does that make sense? Does that make sense where we are? Next week, we'll talk about marriage. Um, and this illustration that Paul gives about marriage. Did anyone get to read 6, 7, and 8 by any chance? You did. That's great. You did. Fantastic. All right, let's pray. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for your life that you've promised us, this brand new life that you've given us. And Father, when this evil and wicked master yells at us and tells us we have to obey it, Lord, please help us to hold your hand and to look at you. Help us to walk with you because we're not alone. We are released from this prison and we have been given this brand new life to live. Father, help us to count ourselves dead to sin, but alive to you in Christ Jesus. And Father, the eternal life that you've promised us, it has begun and we get to walk with you for the rest of eternity beginning today. Thank you so much, Lord, for your grace. And I pray, Lord, that for each one of us, we would be people who are children of the light, who walk with you, who shine like the stars even today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.